It's so true. And one of the things I'm a humongous proponent of is we need to set ourselves up for success because as soon as you start doing these ridiculous things that, that don't work, every time it's like just another little another little notch that makes it a little bit harder the next time. And I mean, again, my own experience was I, I tried those gimmicks. I tried the juice detoxes. I tried the drink this drink for 24 hours and you'll lose five. I tried more than I care to admit. And I got to the point where I, I genuinely had that moment of, of I give up. I can't, I can't lose weight. It is, it is not possible. And in reality, what actually worked for me, and again, I'm sure we'll get into it more, but it, was, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't complex. It wasn't a gimmick. It was the things that I, I knew in my, in my core would work is ultimately what did work. And yeah, it's, 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 I, I, I completely understand why so many people find it so difficult. That is is Tim Ford this week on the Do It For Yourself podcast. up how is it going i have returned from the sunny shores of myrtle beach south carolina and although i have a massive pile of laundry that is building up from both sitting on the beach all day and going out for quite a few bike rides down there um i must say one riding my bike at the beach is one of my absolute favorite things to do um but Man, there are some really, really beautiful routes down there in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, I stopped into a local bike shop down there. It's called Petey's Bike Shop. And I was in search of some new CO2 cartridges. Um, I had a couple CO2 cartridges uh, in my saddle pack. Long story short, um, I tried to use them to inflate my tires. It didn't work out so well, so I needed new ones. And so I went in, I started chatting with some of the guys. And this guy Jeff in there, he just took a bunch of time to show me the motor, the Myrtle Beach Cycling website where it has a calendar of events and different routes on there. Um, so I ended up being able to ride some different routes while I was down there. And it was just a really great time. I love riding, you know, down at the beach. So it was nice to be able to get out there and do that and do something that I really enjoy um, while on vacation and still trying to relax and enjoy some time with my family. Um this week on the podcast, I have an amazing guest whose name is Tim Ford. And Tim Ford is an elite level triathlete. Uh, he's done over a hundred different triathlon races. Um, he's the CEO and runs Team Maca X, which is another elite level uh, racing team out there, um, and he is on a quest for a 405 half Ironman, which we'll get into why it's such a specific time um, in the podcast here. But the reason why I wanted to get Tim on this show so bad was that Tim had actually clocked in at 264 pounds when he did his first triathlon. And he did an Olympic distance triathlon in four hours and five minutes, weighing 264 pounds. So if you can imagine that, he was clocking in at that weight and he did his first triathlon. They were cleaning up the course behind him, picking up the cones as he was on the run. And he still fell in love first with the cycling aspect of this sport and then continued on and really got into triathlon and really started taking this seriously. Um, so I don't want to take too much away from Tim's story. I really want to get into it. Um, it was a great interview. I really enjoyed getting to know his story a little bit more and I can't wait to share it with you guys. Well, let's get rolling here. Um, I'm joined by Tim Ford this evening. And Tim, I just want to say thanks so much for jumping on. Um, it's it's kind of strange for me because 
I see you're drinking a cup of coffee. You're probably just finishing up your morning training and having breakfast. And uh, for me over here in the States, um, I'm getting ready for dinner. So this is definitely, <laughs> this is one of the most opposite ends of the spectrum uh, time differences that, that I've had. So I thank you very much for, for being super flexible and, you know, being able to jump on with me here this afternoon for me and morning for you. No, mate, firstly, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. As I said, I really love the opportunity to, to talk to people and, and I guess try to share this message about you know, getting active and getting healthy. And uh, not only is it a different time, I'm a day in the future as well. So if you want any you know, predictions about what happens on Friday or Thursday, you know, I, I can give you some tips because, yeah, we're you know, magically in, in the future in Australia than you guys are in America somehow <laughs> through the, the miracles of time. And I'm actually going to, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling to North America for the first time in August. I'm doing a, a, a so I work for Mac X. The training group and we're doing a camp in penticton uh, in august around the super league triathlon and when i was booking or looking at my flights because i'm i'm flying back and almost straight away like I'm, I'm racing the following weekend and i was thinking if i leave on the monday i actually don't arrive back in australia to the wednesday i was like oh no i lose a day like so it's, it's thrown my whole my whole plan out the window because of that that weird crossing the date line thing that happens so Yes, mate. Uh, a long way of saying yes, the times are, are different. <laughs> wow. And that's crazy. I mean, I know. So actually, it's funny. One of the uh, a guy that I just raced with last weekend, um, they are from Australia and they go back over there at least once a year. And I was just I was talking to them, you know, about the length of the flight from they usually fly, I think, out of New York um, or one of the larger airports that's over here on the East Coast when they go um, over slash down. And I mean, he was telling me how long the flight is to get over there. And I was like, God, there's, there's, I don't know. I don't know that I could, I don't know that I could sit on a plane for that long. Yeah. I'm about to jump on a plane next week. I'm flying to Norway for a, a friend's wedding. And it, I'm obviously my, well, not obviously my wife's Norwegian. So we lived in Norway and I've done the trip to Norway many, many times. And I think the longest it ever took me was like a 40 hour trip. And there was, uh, it's just, it's a, everywhere's far away from Australia. No, nowhere's close. So it's, it's all right though, but yeah. It's, it, it does uh, take its time. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so let's let's get into your story here a little bit. And I kind of want to start from, you know, from somewhere in probably the, the very early days um, where you had a friend who said to you, you know, hey, I want to sign you up for this triathlon as yep. your birthday present. And at the time, you were clocking in the scales at... 264 it's 264 pounds and that was the last time you had weighed yourself on the scale correct yeah i think i hit i again i'm, I'm not so sure with pounds sorry uh, but we i think the last time i weighed myself i think i was like 121 kilos and i just went i, I went into denial basically and said i don't want to i don't want to see that anymore it's it's not making me feel very good about myself so i i stopped weighing myself and i, I know that i got heavier because my clothes certainly got tighter uh, but yeah that's the last time i weighed myself yeah, yeah, yeah. 100, 120 kilos converts to almost exactly 264 pounds. So um, so this friend says to you, hey, Tim, I want to sign you up for this race. And you you just agreed to this? You were like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah, I know. It, 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 saying it in hindsight's a bit funny, but I think, I mean, I can't think of too many things, If I put, maybe with the exception of an Iron Man, but if a lot of people have said to me, oh, do you want to do this? I normally say yes. Like, I'm quite happy to try new things and you know i think the fact that the, the race was held at this beachside location in australia called byron bay which is you know one of the most beautiful beaches the country has and everything probably was a another sort of feather in its cap or another reason why i was pretty keen to say yes but yeah i just i thought yeah why not like i, I think i've I, I admit i was probably in a little bit of denial about how unhealthy i was uh I, I mean i knew i was big but you sort of very you become very good at rationalizing why are you big? So, you know, I was big, I was muscly, I was strong, I, you know, I lifted weights. These are all the, the sort of lies that I, I try to tell myself to make myself not deal with the fact that I was, as you say, 264 pounds. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so leading up to the race, were you doing any sort of training at all? Aside from the weightlifting that you had been doing, were you doing any swim, bike and run? Oh, definitely. I, I, when I signed up for the race, I, I, I think I, I, I thought it would be a good opportunity to try to lose weight. I mean, I, I, I think I said to myself, how can you not lose weight? Like, you know, you, if, you're, if you're training for a triathlon, you're going to lose weight. So I, I didn't do too much running because obviously being that big, it was quite hard. So I did a lot of my training on the cross trainer at the, or the, you know, the, um, what's the other word for it? The erg trainer at the gym. Mm-hmm. 
I used the spin bikes at the gym or the just the exercise bikes. And I think once before the race, I managed to ride for 40 kilometers and it took me like two hours on the exercise bike. And I went, oh, okay, I know I can do that. And swimming, I probably, I, I swam maybe a kilometer, a couple of, maybe once or twice a week. And then actually immediately followed it up with eating like half a kilo of pasta because I was like, I'm carbo loading. I need to, I need to burn it, eat extra food because I'm burning all these extra calories. And yeah, look, in reality, I don't think I trained properly at all. I was maybe doing five hours training a week and definitely overeating thinking that I needed to. But I thought, I thought I was doing the right thing. Uh, again, I, now that I obviously with the, with the benefit of hindsight, I understand how bad my training actually was, but I had no idea. Like I really didn't have any idea what I was doing. I just figured as long as I can, you know, ride for 40 kilometers, swim one and a half kilometers and cover 10 kilometers, I'll be fine. I just didn't ever think about, well, I have to do one after the other, after the other. And, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's funny. It's very funny. I I I I thought I was training, but obviously, obviously not properly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, you were at least getting out and doing something. Yeah, so, definitely. And so, leading up to this, and I don't know how many you know weeks or months or however long it was beforehand, but you had a doctor's appointment. You were feeling sick leading up to the race. So, how long was that before your race? And, you know, what were some of the things that they discovered during this appointment? Yeah, I think, well, when I was bigger, I used to get sick a fair bit. I have asthma. I don't, I don't struggle with it so much anymore, but I used to get chest infections fairly, you know, maybe once, once or twice a year. So, I think it was about eight weeks, maybe eight or nine weeks out from the race, maybe eight weeks out from the race. That I, again, I got a chest infection, but it was quite bad, like very bad, actually. I was, very, I was, yeah, it was no good. And I went to the doctor because I was coughing really bad and all this, you know, could barely breathe. And they said, oh, well, look, we think they might, you know, we, we're going to send you for a chest X-ray. So I went away, had the chest X-ray. They were testing for pneumonia uh, because they thought I had pneumonia, which I did. It turned out that I had pneumonia. So I had to go on, you do all the physio for pneumonia, which I assure you is not fun. Basically, you have to have somebody smack your back to try to break up all the, the liquid in your lungs and cough it out, which was horrible. But uh, yeah, when I had the X-ray, the doctor called me and basically said, look, you know, we were testing for, for pneumonia, but the, the x-ray shows your heart's enlarged. And I was like, oh, okay, okay what, what, what does that mean? It's like, well, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not a good sign. It means it's, it's one of the early signs of heart disease. I was like, what? He's like, I'm, I'm 20, I'm, I was 24 at this point and that really scared me. And so they sent me off to do some other tests. I had a, you know, bloods done. There was high cholesterol and they took my blood pressure. My blood pressure was getting close to high blood pressure, like not, not terrible, but certainly higher than it should be. And yeah, look, it scared the bejesus out of me. Uh, it wasn't very good. And, I, and again, same thing when the doctor said, you know, your heart's big. I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm training for a triathlon. Are you sure it's not just that I'm a, you know, I'm a bit of an athlete now? And he's like, mate, the amount of training you'd need to do to get your heart this big is looking at you. It's not, it's not true. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely because of lifestyle and, and things like that. So that certainly gave me a bit of a fright. But again, it wasn't like, you know, you're going to drop dead any minute. It was still sort of be aware, like, you know, it's it's not past the point of no return or anything like that. And that, I think the fact that I was training for a triathlon also probably helped me to rationalize that it's not it's not super, super serious yet because, look, I am sort of trying to do the, the right thing. Uh, but it's it really scared me. Like, it, it gave me a... I had to have all these tests done. I had to go to see specialists and have, you know things where they measured my heart rate to look for murmurs and yeah, all, all, yeah, all these tests that, yeah, it was, it was a not only scary, but quite expensive process actually. Now that I think about it with all the, the tests that I had done and again, you know, you think in Australia, we, there's a lot of advertising on television about heart disease and being heart smart. And it's always sort of portrayed as an old man's or a middle-aged man's sort of problem. And the fact that I was so young and it was happening, yeah, it was kind of like getting slapped in the face with, or quite confrontational. The fact that, yeah, you know, this is something that I'm, well, you know, going to be dealing with very soon if I don't do something about it. And now, did they did they clear you for the race? I uh, don't. I don't really. Know. I don't think I really told them. I. I, I think I. I probably was advised not to, and I just did it anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I. I remember there was one of the tests. Uh, one of the tests they wanted me to do was I was to wear a, a monitor for like twenty four hours, something like that, to see if there was any variations in my heart rate and stuff, and. To be honest, I didn't do it. I just, I just never went back to that doctor because, of, again, it was very confrontational. And, and again, I think it's, it's not a good thing to admit, but I, I, I sort of would rather have not known. So I just, I just never did that test. And after that process, I, I, 
I sort of convinced myself that if I, if I tried to make healthy changes, I could probably self-correct it a lot. I never took any medication for it. I got my pneumonia better. I kept on plugging away towards that triathlon. And like I said, in hindsight, it probably wasn't the, the safest thing to do, but you know, it, it's worked out okay for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could, you could say that. You could say that for sure. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk about that race. Let's talk about that first day. Um, yep. you, you did an Olympic distance race, um, yep. and it was, it, it took you, you cl- com- completed the race in four hours and five minutes. Um, That's right. and so what were some of the things that really stand out in your mind, um, from that day? Uh, man, I, I, I remember that day so vividly. I, I, I remember, I really remember because it, it's, it's a lunchtime start. A lot of the races in Australia start, you know, at the crack of dawn or six o'clock in the morning or before the sun's up. But this race is in the middle of the day. And I remember the first thing was rocking up at the race and I had this you know, $100 bike I bought on eBay. It was too small for me. It had, it had the, the drop bars, which was good. So at least I thought I knew, I looked like I knew what I was doing. And the first thing I remember is seeing all these time trial bikes with the disc wheels and the aero helmets. And I was like, these, these things are time machines. Like, what, what is this? This is nuts. And everybody's really ripped. And I was like, I, I didn't have a tri suit. I had none of that stuff. I was planning on just sort of, I had a compression singlet and I think a pair of skin shorts that I was planning on wearing. And I, I remember straight away, like going, I, I don't belong here. Like this is, this is, this is not where I belong. Like I don't look like any of these people, I'm, you know, my belly's hanging at the bottom of my, my top and, and those sort of things. And we, yeah, like to the point that I didn't even have tri shorts. And my mum went and bought me a pair of tri shorts before the race started just so that I had some padding on the bike. And I'm glad she did because anybody who's ridden without padding in the bike shorts knows it's not very fun. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember actually standing on the beach before the, the race started and I just had no idea what I, was in, what, I, what I was about to do. And I remember that gun going and getting in the water and I remember trying to swim freestyle and almost getting motion sickness because it was so choppy. So And my wetsuit was too tight, so I had to take my wetsuit off halfway through the swim. I gave it to one of the volunteers and said, can you leave it at the surf club? I'll pick it up after the race. And there's a, the, the, the photo that a lot of people see of me with that before photo is, what people, is, is moments before I get out of that water and just vomit everywhere. Like it was, it was no good. And I think at that point I went, this is going to be a, this is going to be a long day. Like this is not going to be an easy, easy experience. And yeah, look, the bike was, it was fine. I suppose it took a long time. I realized I had a flat tire for probably half the bike leg. Uh, my, my friend who signed up there, his name's Rob. Uh, he stuck with me all day. He just, he, you know, he waited for me when I came out of the, the swim, he was there waiting for me in transition. He rode next to me the whole way and then walk ran the whole run with me. And, I don't remember, I, I remember, I remember the run, the things that remember, I really stand out is like, yeah, obviously the marshal coming up and saying, you know, are you on your last lap when I was on my first lap? And uh, I remember them packing the course, like sort of walking behind me, picking up the cones as I passed. I remember that. And my wife tells me that my wife was at the finish line. And every time I'd run past where my mum and my, my wife and my stepdad were, I'd, I'd sort of try to get a bit of a jog on. So at least they thought I was trying. And after the race, my wife told me that the, the, the commentator at the finish line was actually sort of giving me a bit of a hard time. I mean, I find that surprising because I always find triathlon such an encouraging sport. And, yeah. Uh, my, yeah, my wife sort of went up there and said, you, you know, he had pneumonia six weeks ago, lay off him, he's out there, trying, blah, blah, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it, it, it probably worked out really well because I, I really, really remember the finish. And as I was running towards the finish line, I hear the, I hear the commentator going, there's no one, like, it's packed up, mate. Like, there's no one there. The transition's almost gone. And he, and he said, he goes, the, swim, the, the, the man becomes a swimmer. The swimmer becomes a bike rider. The bike rider becomes a runner. The runner becomes a triathlete. I remember him saying that as I crossed the finish line. I was like, yeah, this is, this is cool. Like, it was great. Uh, I was obviously very, very happy that I finished the race. And it wasn't probably till a little while after where I sort of started to go, well, hang on. Yeah, they were packing the course up and there wasn't really anyone there. And then the results came out. And, I, and, I, and like, literally, it was me at the bottom with my friend Rob. And then there was hours between me and the next person and i and i, I was like wow okay i i knew i'd be bad but i don't think i realized i'd be i'd be that bad and yeah it was quite it, it was it was embarrassing like it, it was it's i've said this before but it's so funny because i was so proud of myself for finishing a triathlon but i was so embarrassed or humiliated by the fact that i was so far behind everybody and yeah, it, it's a really, it's a funny thing that you have such conflicting emotions at the same time. It, it, it's still like when I think about it, 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 I'm not comfortable. Like it doesn't make me feel comfortable thinking about that. But 
it was yeah, like I said, I have very vivid memories of that day. And and again, my friend standing next to me on the run when I wore the run, the walk, mm-hmm. saying to him, you know, God is my witness, I'm never doing this again. Like this is this is a huge mistake. What have I done? <laughs> this was not a good idea. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and that's I what I was. I that's what I was just gonna say. So I rem- I mean, I know that you said that to your friend. You know, you looked at him dead in the face and you said, uh, you know, I'm never gonna do this again. Um, but obviously, you know, you have been doing it again. So what, what happened that made you come back? Like, obviously you felt really good finishing the race, even though you had like this conflicting idea in your head of, man, I was last and, you know, but I I did have fun as much as it kind of hurt. Like it was, you know, it was kind of a good hurt. Like, so what kind of brought you back for your next one? I think doing the race, like I really remember during the race, I I enjoyed the bike a lot. And I thought, you know, bike riding is, at least it didn't hurt like running did. So I I sort of saw it as an opportunity that this is something that I could probably use to get fit. I went and bought myself my first carbon fiber bike and started to ride as much as possible. And I enjoyed it. And and I think something that I've always sort of, and and I'm not sure if it's necessarily what my parents intended when they, when I grew up, but I've always sort of had this belief that if you're going to do something, do it properly. I don't like to half, you know, half, half ask things. If I'm going to try to do something, I want to do it properly. And I got the idea that I need to do this. I need to do a triathlon properly. So I started, yeah, I started thinking, and again, I, I didn't do the next triathlon for, you know, 18 months, 18 months, two years later, but I've really thought if I'm going to do this again, I want to do it properly. And yeah, that, that's the sort of spark that, that got me going because th- I mean, there is something so, I, you really understand, and now that I've worked with a lot of beginner athletes as a coach, I really understand that you do that first one, and it gets its hooks in you. It gets it, it, there's something about the there's something about the sport that you just you go from sort of wanting to try it to trying one, and then you're all in. Like it, it, I don't know many other sports that can really just grab you so quickly, and it certainly happened for me. That that was definitely my experience. Is yeah, I'm I'm into this. This is this is great. So decided to to try again or no pun intended yeah and and i mean i completely agree with you and and like for me i my race was in september and i didn't get a road bike until june like before that so i had like you know a couple months to train on the road bike and you know i had so many people that were like hey like don't go crazy on the bike like just just get the bare essentials you know you have no idea if you're really gonna like this or not and i mean i just remember thinking like well i'm I'm really liking this just training right now. And I'm really having a lot of fun doing this just now. And then I did the first race and it was just like, it was amazing. And I mean, the mm. the race that I did was, it was smaller than it is now. And, you know, now it's the, the regional championship for, you know, the, the region that where the race is located in. And it's just, I mean, the race has grown so much so, but I just remember like even as a you know an air quotes smaller race like it just had this whole vibe about it and the community that surrounds triathlon like you were saying I mean it's just it's amazing and I haven't found it anywhere else like there's competition Mm. there's competition for sure and you know but the same guy that you're running you know neck and neck with and you're sprinting down the finish line for that you know age group position or whatever the case may be i mean look at these some of these pros like they're sprinting down the finish line next to one another and it's one of the highest forms of competition you could see and then what do they do when they cross the finish line it's like they immediately cross the finish line they're high-fiving each other giving each other a hug like man that was a great race and now with instagram you can see you know cam die is is tagging so and so and you know i had so much fun chasing him down on the run all day long and i just couldn't catch him like it's just such a great community Mm, absolutely and that's why i think it's so one of the things i really try to do is I, i'm a big advocate of using it as a, as a way of getting healthy because i think it is such an inclusive sport and uh, when i lived overseas in europe i did i did a lot of bike races and i found cycling again no crit no you know if you love bike riding nothing wrong with that but i found the cycling community were a bit more aggressive whenever i was doing bike races, i was always getting yelled at and getting screamed at in languages i didn't understand and i didn't really know what was going on where like even that first race in in you know 2010 i remember the people who'd finished and they were you know they were going back to their cars with their bike nobody was laughing at me nobody was pointing their fingers at me nobody was going look at this guy what's it everyone was like go mate keep going you're doing so well the the support is is always so encouraging i mean even it's funny because even last year i had a race 
And again, I was trying to go under four hours, 10 minutes for a half Ironman. Like I was, I was trying to go fast this day and I had a flat tire on the bike about seven kilometers from transition and I couldn't couldn't fix it. So I've, I walked, ran with my bike the last seven kilometers back. So I was, you know, by far my slowest ever bike split. I think I ended up going about six hours in the day. But as I was running through the field, like I, I ran very quickly and nobody was like, everybody was like, go mate, you're going so well. Like everybody is just so positive. And I mean, look, let's be, I, I understand that there are there are elements of the sport or there are people in the sport who maybe aren't. So, I mean, you only have to jump on Twitter or sometimes on Instagram to see that some people aren't so happy. But I think the overwhelming majority of people in triathlon are incredibly encouraging and supportive. And it's something I haven't found in other sports. It's, yeah, I really, I, I'm very happy and lucky to be part of this community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that for sure. And so I, I want to, kind of go back to your test results a little bit and kind of talk, yep. talk about two things um, from your test results. So the first thing I want to talk about was, um, do you remember how you got to the point of being, you know, 264 pounds or 120 kilos? I think so. I mean, I, I, yeah, look, alcohol was a big part of it, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, probably my lifestyle, I was working in hospitality at the time, but uh, I think that the, I was obviously getting bigger as I got older and then the drinking didn't help. But I, I was always sort of big, but not too big. And then I got a job working overnight shifts at a hotel on their reception when I was, it was, it was part of my industry placement for my degree. And so I'd be, you know, going to work at 11 o'clock at night, finishing at seven o'clock. And I think the different hours or the, the disruption to my body clock, the fact that I wasn't doing any exercise at all, like at all, nothing. And then add in the the copious amounts of alcohol and the weird eating hours. So I was eating dinner at you know seven o'clock with with my housemate and my, my now wife. And but then I was going to work and eating a big and I mean a big dinner at like four o'clock in the morning when I sort of think your body's not really meant to to be eating. And that's it. and again it wasn't like I was always nights. Like I I maybe worked nights four nights a week and then the rest of the time I tried. So my body clock was all over the place. My metabolism was all over the place. And that period that period I definitely got big like that's that's what sort of led me to get bigger and then i always really struggled to lose weight so once i'd get bigger even if i sort of clean things up my weight would always stay about the same and yeah look it was just i mean it, i don't think it's a mystery like i didn't exercise i ate too much i drank too much and i'm not and i wasn't eating well like i didn't eat vegetables i i ate too many processed carbs i ate i didn't really give much thought about what i ate i you know i just ate what tasted good i didn't think about the needs of my body I, yeah i mean I'm, yeah it wasn't it wasn't anything drastic it wasn't i wasn't ever it was never a, a, an emotional thing for me it was never a it was never a uh, a tool for dealing with other things it was just yeah that was i was lazy with what i ate i didn't give it much thought and i liked food and drinking i guess is is how i got as big as i did and i'm sure you probably still like food and drinking right now you just kind of have a, a way to balance it out Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's, actually, that's actually a very good point. Is it, 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 It's not like all of a sudden I'm like, I don't like that stuff anymore. It's easy, easy. It, it's it's a constant. It's a constant challenge. And I think now because I do, I am much more careful with what I, not even what how I eat and, and how often I do. It's when I do then go and have a, a meal that I really want. I look, I enjoy it so much more as well because I think when you're eating rich, you know, over the top food all the time, it just becomes normal. And then it's not that special. Whereas now that, I do very rarely actually go out for a fancy dinner or anything. When I do, I really have a great time. Like it, it, it makes the the enjoyment a lot better too because it is it is a, a treat, I guess you'd say. Yeah. If that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we'll come back to that because there's definitely something that I wanted to mention about that as well. Um, yeah, but for sure. but there was one thing that I wanted to also ask you about the test results. And when the doctor came in and you know he said to you like, "Hey, you have this high blood pressure. You have this high cholesterol." Um, you know, did they offer you any tips or advice to kind of like combat that? Because I know that when I was bigger and I would go to my doctor, like the only thing that the doctor would say to me is he would say, hey, have you ever been concerned about your weight? And I'm like, yeah, no, no, it's never really been a concern for me. Like, should I be concerned about it? Like, is there anything I should do? So I never really got any support or help or tips or anything from from my doctor. And I was wondering, you know, was that different for you? I know that when I was, I'd see the doctors, they'd always maybe jump on the scales and they say, oh, look, you know, you need to start doing something about your weight. And that was the extent of it. And 
when I had the the tests, I don't, when I had the x-ray, I don't remember the doctors giving me any weight loss advice, but I do remember when the blood, the, the cholesterol thing, the only tip I remember them giving is, oh, just cut back on like baked goods. Just stop having cakes and, and pastries. I was like, oh, okay, that, okay, no worries. And that, that was, that was probably the extent of the, the health advice. I mean, the, the weight loss advice I got from my doctors. That was, that was it. Nothing, nothing else. Yeah. That, I mean, and, and it kind of just baffles me almost a little bit because they're saying that you need to do something, but obviously if you are the size that you are, you don't really know what to do and you don't really know what to start. So you, you need somebody to shine a little bit of a flashlight or something and say, Hey, you know, come over this way. Let me kind of get you started. But they, it seems like everyone that I've talked to, you know, who has a similar story to you and I, those doctors, the same people that were saying you need to do something about this, they weren't offering any help. And I just don't, it's something that I don't understand. You, you say it now and it absolutely makes sense to me. I, I never actually thought of it from that point of view, but you're exactly right. I mean, one of the one of the problems I find with, with fitness weight loss, I guess it's the, the motivation for starting my podcast, is that there is, there is too much information. Mm-hmm. And it's not only that there's too much information, but it is every single way, angle, variation you can find it you whatever you want to do you'll find somebody who says it'll work for you there's there's too much information and there's too much pushing of things that aren't that don't really work it, it's it's very overwhelming for a person who like myself or like yourself w- were it's very hard to get started only because it's almost like where do i what do i do like every, you know joe's telling me that i can get six pack abs in three weeks this person's telling me that i can you know drink this juice and i'll lose 15 kilos joe's telling me that if i you know, train for 20 minutes a day, five days a week, I'm going to get a, you know, going to look like a bodybuilder. Like there's so much information and the messaging is, is it's so closely linked to emotion mm-hmm. that it, it, it becomes incredibly difficult to actually sift out the objective measurable truth. Because again, when you think about this stuff, the actual research, the actual, the actual methods based in evidence, they're not sexy. They don't have, they don't have a, you know, a male model and a bikini model standing on a platform vibrating while they're smiling they like that that doesn't attach to, to actual research the research is scientific papers presented by people who have spent a lot of time studying you know very complex uh methods and and different different ways of losing weight that that's not sexy that's not that's not going to be on an infomercial that's not going to say lose weight in eight weeks like that's the thing there's there's it's so difficult to get started and i think you're you're exactly right if, if the doctors could go you know, here's a simple, you know, here's simple things you can actually start to do. That would, that would make it a lot easier for people, I think, to, to, to just get started. But I, on the flip side of that, I also think now that there is a real movement now, and that's something that I'm noticing again, uh, through the interactions I have with people that come on my, my podcast, is that there's a lot of people who are sort of trying to start that message that it doesn't have to be complicated, that it doesn't have to be difficult. It's, because fundamentally, I think we all understand at a base level what we do and don't need to do if we want to be healthier. It's just that, yeah, there's all this all this clutter in the way that makes it quite hard. Yeah, and I think actually to just to speak to, you know, a couple of those points that you made, you know, drink this skinny tea or, you know, work out 20 minutes and get six-pack abs in, in four days, you know, like any of this bullshit that's out there, you know, I think the other thing that happens is, is is people get sucked in and they try these things, you know, exactly because you know I did. the sex I did. sells, I was, uh, yeah. and like you see the guy with the six pack abs and you're like, oh man, he's doing that when, and you try it and it doesn't work and then you get frustrated and you're like, see, I I knew I couldn't do this and it's mm-hmm. just it's not your fault, you know. It's it's so it's so true and one of the things I'm a humongous proponent of is we need to set ourselves up for success because as soon as you start doing these ridiculous things that that don't work every time it's like just another little another little notch that makes it a little bit harder the next time and i mean again my own experience was i I tried those gimmicks i tried the juice detoxes i tried the drink this drink for 24 hours and you'll lose five i tried more than i care to admit and i got to the point where I, i genuinely had that moment of of i give up I can't, I can't lose weight. It is, it is not possible. And in reality, what actually worked for me, and again, I'm sure we'll get into it more, but it was, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't complex. It wasn't a gimmick. It was the things that I, I knew in my, in my core would work is ultimately what did work. And yeah, it's, 
it's it's I, I I completely understand why so many people find it so difficult. Yeah. So uh, that and that that was the next thing that I wanted to just kind of like segue right into is that what were some of the the immediate changes that you made um, to kind of get you started onto this right path and this path that this time was your last time starting. This was the one that was going to stick. I think maybe because it wasn't it wasn't about losing weight as much as it was about actually getting ready for a race. I think, I mean, it, it's hard because it, I, I can look back and I go, yeah, I was absolutely just training for that triathlon, but I, I, I definitely was training because I wanted to get in better shape. And I think it was just, I, I, I started training more. I, I made myself go to the gym every day and I would spend 45 minutes doing weights and then I would spend an hour doing cardio every day. And if that, if that meant I was at the gym until nine o'clock at night, so be it. I, that's what I did every single day, seven days a week to start with. And then I moved overseas with my wife. And from there, I think I think that's where I definitely got more into the training. I, I, I started to do cycling classes and I started to have fun with my training. And I remember I didn't, I didn't realize I was losing weight. And then one day, I think we went to visit my, we were at my mother-in-law's house and she had a scale. And, I, and again, I hadn't jumped on a scale in 18 months at this point. And the last time I jumped on the scale, the number was like 100 and, 120 odd kilos. So I jumped on the scale and it was 100, I think the number on it was like 113 kilos. I was like, well, wow, like, holy, you know, look at this. I've, that's, that's, I haven't seen that number on the scale for like three years. And from that, I definitely got, that certainly got me motivated to, okay, I think I can do this. So I sat down with my wife and I said, look, I, you know, I think this is working. It was my birthday and my birthday was in January. Fun, it's always about my birthdays with me. So I said to my wife, get me a gym membership. Get me a gym membership for my birthday. So she, she signed me up for the gym. Same thing, started going to the gym. I think the routine that I got in was I would go to the gym in the mornings. I would do the same, the 45 minutes of weights and then you know 45 minutes to an hour of cardio. And then and the cardio was either the cost trainer or the treadmill. And then it was in the evenings, I do a cycling class. And like, again, it's not like it just started working for me. The running was, was brutal. It was so hard for me to, to run. I, I, I found a two and a half kilometer loop and I said every day I have to run further than I did the day before. So like the first day, I think I ran 200 meters and started to walk. The next day, 400 meters and started to walk. And then I kept doing that until all of a sudden I could do the lap once and then I could do the lap twice. And I remember one of the times like I was at the gym and I ran for eight kilometers, eight kilometers nonstop. And it took me, you know, an hour or whatever. It was not fast or whatever, but I came out, I came running out of the gym. My wife was there waiting in the car for me and I was so excited. It was like I'd won the lottery. I was like, you're not going to believe it. I ran eight kilometers. Like, I can't, what's happening? Like this whole, everything was sort of starting to work and it made me so excited. And it, 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 it was so hard not to get caught up in that. And that's definitely the, the first big change was just actually following a plan and, and being consistent with it. Because I think, again, I was sort of before jumping in and out i'd try something for a few weeks nothing would really work or i wouldn't think it would work and i mean even things like working with personal trainers i used to feel like they were sort of punishing me for being so big like they'd make these sessions almost impossible for me to do and that's what i talk about setting yourself up for success if the person you're working with isn't is, is not helping you to be successful it's just going to make it worse you get demoralized you feel guilty you feel like you're being judged you feel like it's not you know it's not if it, you know is there something wrong with you because it doesn't work yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and it, I mean, it's not like, like we were saying, it's not your fault. Um, it, there's just, it, they grab your emotions with marketing and that's the point of marketing. I mean, I get it, but you know, it's like these snake oil salesmen out there are just, it seems like they're out there to get that, that quick cash. And then next thing you know, you know, some of these companies, they're not even around anymore. You know, you, you don't, some of the names you're like, who, who was that? What are they, what were they yeah. doing again? It's like, you know, so now that that was some of the changes that you made fitness wise. Um, yep. But I think uh, and you would probably agree with this, that, you know, probably 80 to 90 percent of the success doesn't come from what you're doing in the gym, but it actually comes from what you're doing outside of the gym. Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little bit about your diet and, and some of the things that you cut out um, from your mm -hmm. diet. So, yeah, that's that's exactly right. I, I think. The first bit of weight that I lost, I didn't really make big changes to my diet. It was just purely from exercise. And then when I started to focus on actually losing weight, I started to weigh myself every week. I noticed that my weight loss plateaued. I'd lost about 15 kilos and it's it's for like two weeks, stayed the same. I ever, I start, and again, you're right, I started exercising more, thinking, oh, that didn't fix it. And that's when I said, okay, I need to start focusing a bit more on my diet. So 
again, as I said earlier, I really like food and I'm never going to be that person who can eat chicken and broccoli. Like that's not going to work for me. So I started researching recipes. Like I looked up recipes that, that were lower in calories that still, you know, sounded nice. So it was a lot of things like, you know, turkey meat or turkey burgers, I think we were doing. And we just found all these different recipes, like some were pastas that had less pasta, but more sauce. So, you know, chicken. So it's almost like that you flip it around where, you know, traditional pasta is all this pasta with a bit of sauce where this one was all this sauce with a bit of pasta or, you know, lots of salad, not salads, meats, you know, lots of things that weren't, again, they're probably not as healthy as I eat now, but they were healthy enough or they were big enough improvement from what I'd been eating previously to then see the weight drop off again. And, and it, that, so that sort of, again, worked. I lost that 30 kilos. And then I sat, again, without, I don't think the changes were, were super drastic. Like I, I obviously started to eat more vegetables and, 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 and cut out a lot of, I stopped eating a lot of processed foods. I stopped eating takeaway. I stopped eating a lot of those pre-prepared meals that I think, you know, have so much stuff in it that you don't really know what it is that, that's no good for you. So I think just from cutting a lot of that stuff out, I naturally, I naturally lost weight. But when I really wanted to focus on my diet, when I, now that I'm trying to get, you know, quite fast at, at triathlon, uh, the things I do now, are obviously portion control is a big, big part of, of, of how I eat. So making sure that I don't, overeat so we we weigh out the ingredients before we cook them so there's only enough for one serving so there's no leftovers so i can't go back and have seconds if i'm if i'm still hungry and a lot more uh, you know lean meats with with nice salads but you know obviously not covered in dressing and all that sort of thing so uh, a lot of yeah a lot a lot less a lot less you know things like if there's a like one of the recipes we make for example is of like a beef stroganoff and instead of cream in it it's got natural yogurt like little little things like that as well like you know if you can use something that's he- a healthier not health healthy is maybe the wrong term a a less calorie dense uh, altern- um, alternative we we try to implement those as much as possible and less pre bought products so if you can make something we try to make it ourselves because that way we know what goes into it and yeah they're, they're the sort of things I think it's again it's definitely increase of veggies. Definitely increase vegetables. Like I can't emphasize that enough. I used to eat the only vegetable I ate with deep fried potatoes, and now I could. You know, I eat vegetables every day. I love them. I love them so much. Well, and you uh, you yeah. set a you set a goal for yourself to eat twenty different vegetables like in one week, right? Yeah, that was an idea my dietitian came up with at the start of this year. Uh, now, I, I now work with a dietitian uh, mostly for performance rather than it's not really weight love. I've, I think I've sort of lost enough weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I work with a dietitian, and when we, when I had my break at the start of the year, when we were sort of coming back, and I put on that off season, you know, a couple of kilos, she just said, "Yeah, here's a good idea." And I, I think it's a it's a it's a really great approach for people is don't cut out the stuff you can't eat, but focus on the the stuff you the things you can eat. So. Uh, Chloe set me the goal of 20 different vegetables a week and and that was just so my first thought every time I'd sit down to eat a meal was how many vegetables and then what you find is by focusing on the positives you, you think less about those things that, you know oh, I can't have that I can't have that I can't have that instead it's like I can have that I can have that I can have that mm-hmm. it's it's just it's amazing that switch of how much easier it is to eat well when you're in a positive frame of mind so it, I think again I think the term is crowding so yeah you focus on the positives you can add to your diet and then naturally you fill up on the good stuff. There's less desire or room for the bad things. Uh, you, you just naturally sort of see them, see them go away. And, and again, I, I really don't like the approach of cut everything out. I, I don't like the idea of, you know, you can never have this because as soon as you say this is a blanket ban on anything, I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that test, you know, don't think about the color red. Mm-hmm. The first thing you think about is the color red. So I find any time I've ever tried to completely cut something out of my diet, it's all I want. It makes me, it, 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 I can't help it. So yeah, everything in moderation and just, just learning that. And that's what I was sort of saying about, you know, going out for nice meals much more rarely makes them bigger treat because yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying no, I'm just saying less often. And then when I have them, I really enjoy them. Yeah. And the one thing that I did wanted to say about that, what, you know, while we're talking about food and everything, and I want to get your thoughts on this is, um, you know, having it as a treat, you know, I'm sure like I just raced this past weekend and I'm sure that you've probably done this as well. You know, after the race, you're starving for one. Um, but two, you know, you have some, some room in your calories and your macros or whatever, however you want to look at it, but you know, you have a little bit of room to go and have that cheeseburger and French fries, you know, so that's what you do. Uh, but I think the biggest misconception and you have, you did say this once already is that, you know, Oh, I'm training, I'm doing this. Um, I'm doing triathlons, you know, I could, you know, I can eat whatever I want and using that food as a reward. Um, Mm. And I think that what, what people, the common misconception is that, you know, 
one, people look at their Garmin and they're like, oh, I burned 2000 calories, you know, during this bike ride or whatever the, the training session may be for that day. Um, yeah. And what people don't realize is that that's not exactly an accurate number. Um, so they always, you know, look at that and think, oh, well, I could eat that. But then they don't realize how quickly 2000 calories can add up when you're having a beer and cheeseburger and french fries you know so i wanted to get your thoughts on that and and you know your kind of opinions on using food as a reward as well oh mate like firstly uh, not all calories are created equal i think that's a that's a, oh, you know, 100%. a lot of people you know you, you can eat 2000 calories worth of salad you can eat 2000 calories worth of hamburgers and then what about all the other stuff but Again, the, the, the food for reward thing, and I, I don't know who I heard this from, but they said we're not dogs. Like why are we rewarding <laughs> oh, ourselves with food? I was going to say food? that. Yes, I've heard that too. Oh, yeah, that's... And I, and I think... Yeah, yeah it's funny. I, uh, I, I definitely enjoy a post-race uh, treat, I guess, and I do sometimes go a little bit overboard, but again, it's so rare that it's okay. And that's what I mean when I say things in moderation. There's nothing wrong with going out and having that, that you know, all you can eat buffet or, you know, eating a whole pizza. That, that's okay to do sometimes. It's not okay to do it every time. And, and you're exactly right about that idea that people see that, oh, they've burnt. You know, I, I've had workouts where it said I've burnt like 7,000 calories. And I'm mm-hmm. like, really? I, I don't, I'm not so sure about that. Or, uh, yeah, I think I think people who, who chase or who use the calories they burn as a sort of justification. I mean, you know what? If that's, if that's why you're doing it, okay, if you, if you want to train 20 hours a week so you can eat whatever you like, okay, like that's, that's fine. But again, it, as I said, not every, not every calorie is created equal. You know, you, you might, yes, you might not look overweight, but if you're eating a diet full of, you know, salt and, 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 you know, trans fats and all those sort of things, there's going to be risks of, yeah, you, you know, you could be, you know, you could look healthy, but there's stuff in your body that you're not healthy on the inside. Like there's, there's so much more to it than, than, than a, it's not a simple equation, basically that, you know, bodies are incredibly complex things. You know, you know, if you eat too much, processed foods that cause issues with your kidneys, your livers, you know, different sorts of fat, you know, that, that, are, that are holding these toxins. There's so much, there's so much about diet that simply going, well, I trained this much, I can therefore eat this much is, is it's just a slippery slope to get, to get started on. And again, I think as well, a big thing that we find with a lot of people is there's that it creates a bit of an emotional link to food. You know, if you start to see food as a reward, it can also become like that's a positive feeling. So then when things become hard or you're stressed or things are difficult and you want to feel good, what do you turn to? Food that you get as a reward. And again, it, it goes back to that that dog thing. Like that's how we train animals. Like we train animals that when you're a good boy, you get a treat. <laughs> and I just think it's it's exactly it's it's not a good it's not a good way of thinking about it. With the, the, you know, the, if we can start to think of and it's it's hard. Again, I, I'm I'm sitting here saying this, and I'm like, I'm not I'm not the I'm not an angel. I'm not a saint. I, I do slip up time to time. No, not not you know not infrequently. But we eat we eat so we can live. Like we we go out and we we fuel our bodies. So that we're able to go out there and do the things that we want to do, and it's if you start to think about it that way, it it does it does sort of change your perspective on food a lot. Uh, but yeah, I think simply saying, well, I've trained two thousand calories, I can eat two thousand calories. Just yeah, be careful because there's so much more to it than just calories. There's yeah, as you said, macronutrients, proteins, all those sort of things. You know, am I recovering properly? Do I want to go fast? Is it just about weight loss? Like there's yeah, we could we could do episodes on this stuff. I think. Oh it's- yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think just the last thing that I want to say about this, because um, I, I think this is this is something that's really good, and it's something that I've you know started doing for myself. Um, before you decide to eat something, like before you make your decision of okay, this is what I'm going to eat, think about how that's going to impact whatever your goal is. So. If you are training for a triathlon and you want to compete at a high level in a triathlon or you just want to be successful in a triathlon or whatever it is you want to lose weight, think about before you order that cheeseburger, think about how it's going to impact your goals. And I started doing that and it's really, I mean, it's really impactful. If you take that five seconds to think about that, I would almost guarantee that at least, you know, a couple times out of that that few times that you may slip up, there's going to be a couple times where you say, you know what? No, I'm not going to have that today. And the other thing I find as well, like how often do you eat the food that you, you know you shouldn't have and then you feel, you, you almost feel bad after, not, not necessarily guilty, but you know, so you, if you've had a big, if your body doesn't feel good, 
when I'm when I am trying to think about what to eat to say on weekends when I do relax my food a little bit, I do find myself thinking about how am I going to feel after I've eaten it. Like yes, I might enjoy it while I'm eating it, but then I might not feel great the next three or four hours afterwards. So that's also a, a big thing that I, I take into consideration. And you're exactly right. Taking a couple of minutes thinking about, you know, is this actually, is this in line with my goals? To, you know, and again, it might not work 100% of the time, but even if it works one time out of 10, that's one time less you're eating food that you wouldn't have before. So, Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just kind of, you know, I know I want to be respectful of your time. I know you probably have some work to do. But I just have, a, you know, a couple more things that I, I yeah, wanted mate, to touch on. Um, it's all good. I want to know when you came to the realization that you wanted to take triathlon to the next level. You wanted to take it to the competitive level, and it was more than just a hobby for you. I know that you just completed your law degree. You have a full-time job. You're working. Like, Yes, this is just a side hobby for you, but it's, a, it's also more than just a side hobby. When did you come to that decision or that realization? It's funny you say it as a hobby because I I don't think of it as a hobby. I don't. I, I definitely. You know, I'm obviously not a professional athlete. I don't. I don't make a career out of, of racing. But it's it's so much more than a hobby to me. And I, 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 it is. It's and I, it's sometimes a flaw. I mean, I, it's it's invariably linked to my sense of self in a lot of ways. And it's that's not a good thing to admit. But it's a huge part of my life. I, and I mean, I'm I'm very lucky that as you said, I, I work I work with the sport. I've managed to make triathlon. I've made you know made my my career in triathlon so far. Uh, which is great for me. I think, yeah. Look, I I, I did a, I did a few races. I, I I definitely improved on that first triathlon, and then I decided to do a half Ironman. I was aiming for six hours. Was terrified. Went like five hours, eight minutes, I think. Next one I went four fifty one, and I'm, okay, this isn't this isn't as bad as I expected. And I, it's it's hard because I, I I set myself the goal of going under four and a half hours, and then that took me years and. Somewhere along the way, I think when I started to get down to was at four and a half, I got this idea. Why don't I, why don't I aim for that four o five? So my big goal now in, in triathlon is I'm trying to do a seventy point three in four hours and five minutes, so I can say that I did theoretically or you know roughly the double the distance in the same amount of time as that first race. And I think that goal is probably what made me take it more seriously. I suppose is that it, that, that's a big, intimidating, scary goal for me. It's it's a goal that I might never, never achieve, but through the pursuit of that, I've realized that if I want to do it, I have to actually really change the, my approach. I, you know, take take my training very seriously. Now I work with a coach very closely. I have a dietitian that helps me. I work with a high performance center. Uh, I think it's just those sort of things that made it become, yeah, become. And it wasn't, you know, I've I've won races. I've had good results, and I don't think that's ever what what motivated me to to take it more seriously. It, it was just that that personal goal and. I, I, I have this thing in my head that when I do the 405, I'm probably going to be, it's going to be this huge deal to me. Like It's going to mean the world to me that I can say, look, this is a goal I've been chasing for five years. I've ticked it off if I do. But the world's not, nobody else is going to really care. Like, yes, I'll probably get a few people like, congratulations, that's amazing. And then like, that's it. That, that's that's it. So I think it's all an internal motivator for me. It's it's about, this is what makes me motivated to, to continue my training and keep working and continue to live the lifestyle that I live, which means that I'm healthier. It means I'm not overweight anymore. That means that I, you know, I've made training a big part of my daily routine. That means that I do pay attention to what I eat because it all helps me to work towards that goal. I think is if that's a kind of roundabout way of saying it is it's by taking it more seriously, it's enabled me to, to live a much healthier lifestyle without as much effort because it's all geared towards a goal that is exactly right. It's a, it's a hobby. It's a, it's a leisure activity that I'm pursuing for, for no other reason that, that it was well, a quite a selfish reason is that it helps me to, to live a healthy life. Yeah. And I mean, uh, like I, I couldn't agree more with you there because I don't look at triathlon as a hobby either. I mean, it's literally something that has become an entire part of my life. And mm. it's something that like, I have so much passion for and people are like, Oh my God, I could never do that. You know? And I'm like, well, you could do it. You just don't want to do it. And that's cool. Like, I mean, it's not for everybody, but it's just, if you came into this community, you know, you would kind of understand it, but it seems like the people who are looking on from the outside, they just look at it as a hobby and they're like, okay, well, like, why do you why do you dedicate so much of your time? I mean, you said you train almost 20 hours a week, you know, 52 weeks out of the year. That's a lot, <laughs> mm. you know? Yeah, exactly right. And, it's, it's, and that's what I think. It's a lifestyle. It, that's what I really think about this sport. Unlike other sports, it's not like, 
you know, you don't play for your local soccer team and, you know, go have beers with the boys up. Well, you, know, you do have drinks with your friends sometimes, but it is it is a sport that requires so much of us that it it almost, it, it does it. It forces you to live your life a different way. And that's what I mean when I say that it, that I think one of the big appeals to me is that just by living this lifestyle, it almost, it, 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 it makes a lot of the healthier decisions second nature because of what you need to do to be good at this sport, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So now talking to you know you taking this sport to the next level and taking things you know very competitively um on the triathlon Terran podcast that you said that there's two, two types of training that you can do um and and you mm-hmm. you can use triathlon as your vehicle um for weight loss um and you can train you know to lose weight or you can train to be competitive but it's very yeah. hard to do both um, mm-hmm. can you kind of just break that down a little bit more for us and kind of what you meant by that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, a lot of the people that I coach come to me because they want to lose weight, but they also want to become, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you find this too. People come to the sport and they, I want to go into five hours, my first half Ironman, or I want to, I want to, you know, I want to race Kona one day, but I also need to lose 30 kilos. And they, I think with with the sort of training that you need to do for weight loss it's not the sort of training that you need to do to become a top triathlete if you try to do both at the same time you're not going to really achieve either and, and the way i sort of think about it is if you set your goals around weight loss to start with and you're, you're still training for triathlon you, you, you're, you're you're training for triathlon you're training for swim bike run but the focus is on weight loss you're motivated by the weight loss so what's going to happen is you're going to see the number in the scales drop. You're going to be happy. You're going to be content because the number in the scales is dropping. That's your goal. That's your subjective goal or objective goal, depending on how you want to look at it, is to see the number in the scales drop. You're going to keep, you know, you're going to start doing some triathlons. You're going to get results. You're going to have a benchmark and you're going to get faster because inadvertently through the training, you're going to get quicker because endurance sports is about consistency. Only because you're, and not only, because you're lighter, you're also naturally going to increase your performance. Then what happens with everybody, it's inevitable when once you find your natural weight area, or once you get to a healthier weight, your weight loss is going to plateau. You're not going to start losing those big chunks of weight anymore. If you're still focusing on weight loss, it's very easy to become demotivated at that point. And that's when a lot of people who lose weight put it back on. I think if you've, if you've managed to successfully lose weight, your senior performances increase, you hit that number, or you hit that level, you go, okay, you know what? Now it's time to focus on performance. You start focusing on performance. Your goals or your motivators are no longer about the number on the scale. They're about your results. I'm getting faster. I'm making the podium. I've qualified for the world championships. I've made the national team for this world. You know, whatever your goals are, you start training for that. Your weight's not, you're not going to suddenly see your weight blow out because the training for performance is very demanding. But your body's also are going to have adapted through all of that weight loss training to be at a position where you can really train for performance. You're not carrying a bit of extra weight anymore. You're not having to do that work. You don't have to be careful about your knees because you, you know, you're carrying 15 kilos extra. Through losing that weight, You've built a base of endurance that you're now able to build on with the performance train. And your goals, you're, you're motivated by those performance results. You see the number on the scale is like that secondary goal, much like the result improvements were in the first phase when you're focused on weight loss. But you're motivated to continue through the performance goals. I just think it's a it's a much better way of thinking about it because if you, like, like anything in life, if you're trying to become fast and lose weight at the same time, you're going to do a little bit of each, but you're never really going to get you know, you're never really going to see huge improvements. Or you will, but it'll take you a lot longer. I think if you really want to lose weight, you know, and again, I think the, the good thing with triathlons, you, you sort of want to be a bit crap at the start. Like, it's very rare that you, you know, you come to the spawn straight away. You're, you're a superstar. Like, well, they are those people, and I hate them. I'm oh, I hate those you. people. <laughs> I hate those people. I was just talking about it last weekend with another guy, and you know, we were talking about like some of these athletes that we've seen, and you know. I'm sure obviously, you know, it's, it's a little bit different for you, for you over there, but the, the, almost one of the Holy grails aside from Kona is the Boston marathon over here for us in the States. And it's like, there's some people that just like, they go out and this first marathon that they run, like they have a Boston qualify time and they go and run Boston. And it's like, I've been working at this for so long, like you know, and you come into this sport and just boom, you're qualifying for Boston. It's like, I hate those people. But it's great. I oh, mean, about- it's it's they're coming to the sport. I don't tr- truly deep down, I don't hate them. You know, <laughs> no, it's just, it's like God damn it. I wish I could do what you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like so you saw Javier Gomez did his first Ironman over the weekend down in Australia, and he I think he did like a seven fifty six. It's like something sub eight first Ironman. People are like, oh, he didn't win. I'm like, are you having a laugh? 
This guy has just done his first Ironman ever, sub eight hours on a course that is not, it's not a notoriously fast course. It's, yeah, you bastard, Javier Gomez, how dare you be so good at triathlon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, who was the other one? Wasn't, didn't Jesse Thomas, his first full distance that he went out and did, um, he did really well too, and I think won? Probably. I, 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 uh, there's, there's so many of them. I mean, you've got like, is it, uh, what's his, there's a, uh, there's another guy, I think he's Canadian. And he's done like all of his all of his Ironmans have been under eight hours. Uh, I'm not. I'm having a mental blank. You think I'd know? I host a bloody triathlon podcast with Chris McCormack. Uh, <laughs> it's not. It's not name? Lionel Sanders, is it? No, it's not Lionel. Not, okay. I mean, again, same thing. Oh, what's his name? What's his name? Oh, it doesn't matter. There's another. Yeah, there's another guy. Uh, and he's he's done a whole heap of sub eights. It's yeah. <laughs> bastards <laughs> yeah oh yeah 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 absolutely and so just the last thing i want to touch on um is you know now you're so you said that that this has now become part of your life you know and mm-hmm. in you know it may seem like a good way I mean, to somebody on the outside looking in it may not seem like it's, it's it's a healthy relationship but that's not for anybody else to judge um you know, you have now even immersed yourself further in the sport. And aside from your podcast, the Think Fit podcast that you have, um, you're also running Team Maca X. Yeah, I, uh, I got the opportunity. So I, I came on board with Maca X at the start of last year as a coach. So I, I, I do triathlon coaching as well. And I was brought on with those guys. I've been a member since they started in 2012. And then yeah, at the start of the year, they, they called me up and said, Tim, we want you to become more involved with the team. We'd, we'd, we'd like you to sort of run it because uh, we, they've realized that the team's at a level now where they, it needs sort of full-time attention. So that is that is my uh, my job. I, I get to run a global triathlon team uh, working with, you know, one of my sporting heroes, which is it's it's always a bit surreal and, and, and fun. And yeah, I get to host the podcast with Chris now. And yeah, it's... It's I, I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful for it. it it's it's just yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's, I, like I said, I, I still can't sort of believe it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and I think you know, usually I, I ask somebody at at the end of the show um, to kind of give somebody you know like a a one parting kind of piece of knowledge to take with them to get themselves jump started, you know, on their own journey, no matter what it is. But I don't know, man, I think you, I feel like you've hit the nail on the head like multiple times here on how to get <laughs> people started. So is there anything else that, that you would like to add, you know, out there to the people who are thinking about getting started, but for one reason or another, um, they just haven't taken that jump yet? I think the thing that I, I always say is like, I am the most ordinary person like there is there's not it's you know i wasn't born under the full moon as capricorn was in the 13th I, I, not i am i am joe blow i am that guy on the street that every person was and i thought i could never lose weight i'd given up i thought everything i tried would not work until it did so if you are in a position where you're maybe you're struggling with your weight or you feel helpless or you feel like it's not working for you don't ever give up because eventually you'll find the thing that works for you. That's what is hard. It's about finding what works for you. For me, it was triathlon. For another person, it might be CrossFit. It might be marathon running. It might be inline inline skating. Whatever their thing is, it might be going vegan. Like whatever it is, whatever your your mechanism to health is, that's that's what takes the time. There's nothing wrong with failing as long as you continue to learn from it, but never give up. I think that is the main the main message is because there is always a way. It might feel helpless, but it is possible. It absolutely is. If I can do it absolutely anybody can yeah awesome man awesome well tim i just want to say you know thanks again for jumping on here with me um i really appreciate having you on and i look forward to you know getting connected with you again as things with team mac x grow and things with the think fit podcast grow a little bit more um you know you're doing some some really awesome stuff and uh it was a real pleasure to get connected with you no, thank you so much. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. I really appreciate you, uh, you having me on your show and getting to talk to your listeners and all that and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, again, I love the fact that not only triathlon, but even through podcasts and that I'm able to, to, to meet new people and, and share my story and hear other people's stories. It's, it's, in, it's, it's fantastic. So yeah, mate, thank you so much. Right on, right on. All right. Well, thank you so much, man. I'll let you get going. Too easy, mate. How did that hit you? What did you think? Did you enjoy Tim's story? Did you enjoy Tim's accent? 
if you are not from Sydney. Um, I said after the interview that I think that this may be one of the most downloaded episodes because for those of us here in the States, we are just enamored by that Australian accent. And so I am hoping that you enjoy that as much as I did. Um, I definitely could have talked to Tim for hours. Uh, There were so many things that we agreed on. There were so many things that we just absolutely were seeing eye to eye on. And there were so many parallels between our stories um, that it was just really, really great to sit down and chat with him. Um, I want to thank Tim so much for coming on and for being so open uh, about his story and sharing that with all of you. Um, I really hope that, that you got something out of his story and you could relate and you know apply some of the things that we talked about in this episode. And I want to thank you as the listeners uh, for spending some time with Tim and I here on this episode. And I really look forward to having you back again. Same time, same place next week.